you would, I would think, that given Paul's most complete and definitive statement of the gospel, that it would be reasonable to expect that at some point he would address the important question of the relationship of the gospel to the Jewish people. If the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, why have the vast majority of Jews rejected Christ and continued to do so throughout the whole of Paul's ministry and continue to do so to this very day? And especially given everything that he said in the previous chapter, remember there's no chapter divisions in this letter when it was originally written, Everything that he said in chapter 8 regarding the certainty of God's purpose and plan that he's just finished expounding. And that amazing golden chain of statements, that is that God knew us and loved us and planned us and called us and justified us and glorified us. Given the certainty of that from beginning to end, from eternity to eternity, why so few of the people of Israel? That's the question. I think it is significant that in the first 15 verses of his introduction to the letter to the Romans, he does not expressly mention the Jews. Everything is explicitly and expansively about the Gentiles. Through him, through Christ, we have received grace and apostleship, he writes to call all of the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And a little further he says, I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I had among the other Gentiles. Everything in that introduction beginning is all explicitly about his mission and ministry to the Gentiles. Even though there were Jews in Rome, and even though we know that there were Jews in the Church of Rome. I think part of that is owing to the fact that Paul had been uniquely called and sent primarily as an apostle to the Gentiles, remember. But it was also, I think, because the reception of the gospel had been primarily among the Gentiles. Not exclusively, but primarily. That did not mean Paul did not honor the Jews or care about the Jews because he does go on immediately after that introduction in verse 16 to say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. First to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. Paul believed, affirmed, and affirmed the unique privilege and priority of the Jews as God's chosen people and Acts records that he made it his practice when he went into a community he always first went into the synagogue and it would record in the book of Acts something like um, as was his custom Paul went into the synagogue and for three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures and it was only after they rejected most had rejected that he then turned exclusively to the Gentiles. So it was his practice. In chapters 2 and 3 uh, of Romans, back many months for us now, he lays out very clearly both the Jews' need for the gospel and their invitation to the gospel. They stand in need of the gospel just as much as any Gentile. And they come to faith in exactly the same way. There's no special line, no special entrance for them because they're the Jews. They were the, they were the heart, they carried the promise of the gospel and they were the instruments through which the gospel came. But the gospel that they needed was the same gospel that you and I need. And Paul made that absolutely clear. Virtually everywhere he went, there were Jews who came to faith just in small numbers compared to the Gentiles. And it's clear that throughout his ministry, he was deeply concerned and passionately, passionately labored for Jewish and Gentile unity in the gospel. 
Paul was deeply concerned and deeply committed that there not be two churches, a Jewish church and a Gentile church, because there isn't. There's one church, Jew and Gentile. So his whole, for instance, um, mission of the collection for the poor in Jerusalem that he was adamantly, passionately committed to throughout the whole course of his ministry was to help solidify that this was one church, Jew and Gentile. And he's going to expressly um, address those concerns in chapters 14 and 15 of Romans when we come to that last section. So having addressed the question of Jewish faith, now he addresses the question of Jewish response. And there are a number of questions to the passage. In fact, if I was going to retitle the passage this morning, I would retitle it, Has God's Promise Failed? That's, that's the question that he's addressing as he begins in chapter 9. If they were in need of the gospel and invited to the gospel, why had so few, relatively speaking, responded to the gospel? The question was, has God's promise failed? He begins with an expression of deep and personal grief over their spiritual condition. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. I find it very significant that Paul begins not with the theology, not with the truth, but with the feelings and with emotions about the situation. The caricature of Paul as some kind of, you know, emotionally stunted, relationally challenged, intellectual egghead could not be further from the truth. He very transparently admits his profound sorrow and constant anguish that he carried for the lost condition of his people, whom he calls my people, my brothers and sisters, my fellow countrymen. Many who have doubted that that could possibly be true, given all that he had suffered at their hands for maybe now close to 30 years, you realize that, that almost all of Paul's sufferings and, and definitely all of his severe sufferings can be directly attributed to the instigation of the Jews all the way along. I serve the Lord, he writes, with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. Five times, he says, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That was the most severe punishment that you could receive apart from execution. Five times. 40 lashes minus one. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. He says, I was in constant danger from the Jews. Others, given, others would have assumed that given that long history, he would have been filled with anger and resentment and hatred and revenge. They would have never imagined grief, sorrow, concern. Which is why he begins so adamantly, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have unceasing anguish for them. In fact, his anguish and grief were so great that he could declare, I could wish that I myself were cut off from Christ for their sake. I wish it could be me instead of them. I wish I could be accursed on their behalf. Moses had said the same thing. After the children of Israel sinned against God in the incident of the golden calf, Moses went before the Lord to intercede on behalf of the people of Israel, asking God, pleading with God to forgive their sin. And then he prays this. 
But if not, then blot me out of the book that you have written. Let me be accursed on their behalf. That's divine. That's what Christ did. He said, let me be accursed for them. And that anguish and grief were only compounded for Paul by all of their enormous privileges. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and promises. There, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. The degree and depth of his anguish was compounded by the greatness of their privilege. No pride or arrogance or superiority on his part. No contempt. How could they, how could they do that? They should have known better. None of that. No anguish and grief for all that they had squandered. The true measure and condition of our hearts is when we can feel grief and concern for those who have hurt us and harmed us or disappointed us and offended us. That's the true measure of the condition of our hearts. When, when someone who has hurt me, I can feel grief for them, genuine grief, not anger or resentment or revenge or how can I get back. Or... That was Paul. Wherever we end up on the political spectrum right now, our hearts should break for our nation. We should be filled with anguish and grief. And it should be compounded by the enormous privilege that we've been given of the history of this land. Birthed in, uh, in, a, in a consciousness of, of divine providence. <laughs> a recognition of our absolute dependence upon God. A recognition of the the absolute dignity, human dignity, rooted in creation and God creating us and creating us in his image. And then all of the wave after wave historically in, in the, the history of our nation of revival, of awakening, of churches, and inst great churches and great institutions and colleges and all of the spiritual heritage that we have we ought to be in anguish. What does it reveal about us if we're filled with hatred and anger and fear and revenge? That's not a reflection of what's happening out there. That's a reflection of what's happening in here. When he was reviled, he reviled not. When he hung on the cross, bearing that curse on our behalf, and they were cursing at him and spitting upon him. He says, oh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There is no place for anger and hatred and scorn among God's people. No place. I just think it's so fascinating that Paul, this enormous intellect, begins not with these profound questions, but with the profound emotions of what it was. And only then, in verse 6, does he turn to the truth. And then he says, it is not, though God's, it is not as though God's word had failed. There's the truth. He is just as adamant about the truth as he was about the emotion of his grief and anguish because his emotions were not allowed to dictate or shape the truth. 
Even as great and significant as his emotions were, he didn't tailor the truth to his emotions. And here was the truth. God's word has not failed. As painful and disconcerting as it might be, this was not a failure of God's promise. This was not a failure of God's plan. This was not a failure of God's purpose. Literally what it says, literally when it says God's word has not failed, God's word has not fallen. We'll come back to that near the end this morning. God's word has not fallen. It's not fallen short. It was because of the truth. It is not as though God's word had failed For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. That was the truth. Not all who are descended from Abraham are children of Abraham. There have always been two Israels. Physical Israel and spiritual Israel. Paul has already made that distinction very clearly back in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, when he said this, remember. He said, a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not the written code. That had always been true. It had been true from the very beginning. There had always been an Israel within Israel. And Paul points to two absolutely undeniable, clear examples. Scriptural examples. Not all... Abraham's children were children of the promise. Not all of Abraham's offspring were his spiritual offspring. Verse 7, on the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. It is not Abraham's physical offspring that determines his spiritual offspring. It is not the children of physical descent who are God's children, verse 8. That is determined not by birth, but by promise. Not Ishmael, but Isaac. And that promise rests solely on the sovereign will of God. God says at the appointed time, I will return, Sarah will have a son. It's even more clear in the second example of the twin boys born to Isaac and Rebekah. Because in that case, both were born to the same mother. You could say, well, Ishmael was born to Hagar, Isaac was born to Sarah. But in the case of their children, they are born to the same father, the same mother. At the same time. Because they were twins having been conceived at the same moment. And before either had done anything good or bad, Rebecca was told the older will serve the younger. Jacob would be the child of promise, not Esau. Both were Isaac's children. One was a spiritual descendant, one was not. Which Paul points out underscores two things. Verse 11. First, that God's purpose in election might stand. That's the opposite word of failed. God's promise has not failed. The opposite word, or fallen, the opposite word is to stand. God's promise has not fallen. 
In other words, it doesn't contradict anything that Paul has said about the certainty of God's calling in chapter 8. He knew you before the foundations of the universe knew you, loved you, chose you, planned you, called you, justified you, glorified you. It doesn't contradict that. It confirms it. It shows that what God wills, he will accomplish. That what he decides, his purposes and plans will never fail. What he wills, will. That God's purpose, listen to his words, in election might stand. Before they were born, before they were, before they, either one of them had done anything right or wrong. Because this is oftentimes how Christians have tended to deal with that difficult question. To say, well, God looked and saw what they were going to do, and then he chose them. In other words, his choice is based upon our merit. And Paul's emphatic point is before they had done good or bad. (laughs) And second of all, that decision is based not in any ways uh, upon works. Verse 12, God's purpose in election might stand not by works, but by him who calls. Not that he looked ahead and saw who would choose, but he chose us and we responded to that call. And so the prophet will go on to say those amazing words. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated which have troubled many sensitive consciences, and and understandably so. As someone has said, the real question is not how could God hate Esau? Esau was eminently unworthy, selling his birthright for a bowl of stew. No spiritual concern, no interest whatsoever. But the real question is not how so much how could God hate Esau. The real question is how could God love Jacob? Conniver from the womb. Always manipulating And how could he keep on loving Jacob? In that all-night wrestling match, God persevered with Jacob, and Jacob persevered with God. It's an amazing scene. Jacob says, I'm I'm not going to let you let hold of you until you bless me. God does not let hold of him until he submits. It was finally at that point that finally Jacob submitted to God. But in that amazing wrestling match, Jacob perseveres with God because God had known him and loved him and planned him and chose him. And God perseveres with Jacob to the end. Love never fails. Let me me draw what I think are some important lessons from those verses. God's promise never fails. Never has, never will. We'll spend time over the next several weeks with some of the mystery. But let me just say... There is mystery and paradox, and we're going to live within that paradox and mystery. And Christians through the ages have tried to resolve that mystery and resolve that paradox. We don't do a good job at it because God never intended for them to be resolved. The relationship of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. 
the fact that Esau was absolutely responsible for what he did, the choices that he made. I'll talk about that for just a moment, in just a moment. God's promises never fail, never have, never will. Not all who are Israel are Israel. Not all the church is the church. There was an Israel within Israel, and there is a church within the church. The visible church is not the true church. Only God knows who the true church is. Having said that, it is not our prerogative or responsibility to determine that. The church is not pure, never will be. When people say, well, I can't do that, they're just hypocrites. You're right, there are hypocrites there. You're, you're absolutely right. Our attempts to make it pure will only be destructive, always. Jesus taught in a very important parable that there would be wheat and tares planted. Tares would be sown among the wheat. But he said in that parable, if we attempt to pull up the weeds, we will uproot the wheat. That is God's work to do at the time of harvest when he makes that determination. But here's the important point. Just because you're in church doesn't mean you're in church, in the church. Church membership, baptism in and of themselves are nothing any more than ethnic descent from Abraham. Second, there is a mystery and a paradox in the relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Esau was fully responsible, as I said, for what he did in rejecting his birthright for a bowl of stew. Spurgeon said this, and it's, and it's been quoted often, and, and, and rightfully so. If anybody is lost, the blame is theirs. If anybody is saved, the credit is only God's. That's the paradox. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, Savior wash me or I die. <laughs> That's us. Third, Israel stands as a warning to us to never take our privileges for granted. Paul writes in his first letter to the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, he said, all of them were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink from the spiritual rock that is Christ, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. Fourthly, God's word and promise are certain. They will never fail. We should never doubt it. No one and nothing can separate you from his love. That's the amazing truth of this amazing eighth chapter. If he could love Jacob, he could love you. <laughs> if he can keep loving Jacob, he can keep loving you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. So the truth in the midst of that paradox, we'll, we'll spend time wrestling with that, never in any way diminishes the open invitation to come, anybody to come who will come. And if we come, it will be because of his purpose and because of his plan and because of his wisdom and because of his immense grace 
and mercy. It's the only reason any of us turn. <laughs> and for those who have not, we should feel not anger or contempt. Our hearts should be broken <laughs> as they look at Paul. Pray with me. So it could be that you fall on one side of this discussion, this truth that you have presumed upon your privileges. And when there is a warning to us, we ought to take that warning with all of its due seriousness. There's another, there's a chance that you fall on the other side of that truth presented to us that you lack the security that you should have. Both of those, those warnings and those words of assurance, that great eighth chapter of Romans are both essential and beneficial to the, the well-being of our souls. And so if you are in that place of lacking assurance, then you need to know that when God purposes to love you, he will see it through to the end. And that nothing and no one will ever be able to remove you from his hand and rest in that assurance. And to know that when Jewish people or members of Christ's church display um, unbelief, it is not a reflection on the certainty of God's promise or the certainty of his word. which never falls, which never, never falls. And whose work of calling us always stands, always stands. May he assure your heart in that today. Father, we thank you for these, we thank you for this important section of scripture, first of all, um, that's caused um, puzzlement and consternation to your people in various ways at various times in various places. And yet Paul in the superintendency of your Holy Spirit and in your plan to record this book for all ages took time in these three chapters to address important issues that are not just for our intellectual curiosity, but for our souls, for the good of our souls. And I pray today and in the weeks ahead of us that you'll help us to take advantage of what you want to do in our souls and how you want to equip us through them, I pray. I pray for that. So we thank you. We come back to the place that we began with the recognition of your amazing love. How can it be? And we give you gratitude and thanks and worship and honor and praise for the, for the joy and the gratitude and, and the assurance that comes from knowing that it's not based upon our merit or upon our effort or upon our determination, but your determination. And may we rest in that in the way that you have, would have us do, I pray, this morning. We thank you for our time of communion this morning and pray that you would come now and greet us at your table as we commune with you. Feed our, feed our, our souls, Lord, and encourage our faith. We are so grateful for what you've done. We partake with, with just adoration and thanks today. Bless us.
Bless each one. In Jesus' name, we pray. You're free to come whenever you would like to come.